the closing keynote for this conference from, from amazing British man. Um, everybody please welcome Mr. Jeremy Evans. Today, I'll be discussing some optimization techniques used in SQL and Rota, providing some background on why these libraries are significantly faster than their alternatives, as shown in Tech Empower's independent benchmarks. Now, Tech Empower has been benchmarking web frameworks in many languages since 2013. They have been benchmarking Rails and Sinatra since the beginning. And in 2017, they started benchmarking SQL with Rota. And since then, the combination of SQL and Rota has been leading Tech Empower's benchmarks for Ruby web frameworks. Now, SQL is a toolkit for database access in Ruby. And Rota is a toolkit for writing web applications in Ruby. And while I am not the original author of either library, I have been maintaining both libraries for quite a long time, and I have added all the optimizations that I'll be discussing today. And my name is Jeremy Evans. I started writing Ruby libraries in 2005, and I started contributing to Ruby development in 2009. My day job has me responsible for managing all information technology operations for a small government department, and part of that job is maintaining applications of all sizes uh, written in Ruby using SQL and Rota. Now, while I added all the optimizations I'm discussing today to SQL and Rota, many of these optimizations I learned about from others. In my experience, it is easier to implement optimization approaches that other developers have created compared to developing your own optimization approaches. And with that in mind, the goal of this presentation is to demonstrate some optimization techniques, principles, and approaches that you can use to improve the performance of your own Ruby code, uh, hopefully saving you time should you want to optimize your own libraries or applications. Now, the first optimization principle is that the fastest code is usually the code that does the least. If you want fast code as much as possible, avoid unnecessary processing during performance-sensitive code paths. Now, an old Ruby web framework named Merb had a great model related to this. No code is faster than no code. In other words, if you can get the same result without executing any code, any approach that requires executing code will be slower. A major reason SQL and Rotor are faster than the alternatives is that they try to execute less code, at least by default. So here is the class method that SQL uses to create new model objects. Now the method name used is call, which is kind of an odd choice for a method that creates objects. I'll discuss a little bit later why call is used as the method name, as that relates to a different optimization. But notice how this method does very little. It takes the values hash that was retrieved from the database, it allocates a new model instance, it sets the values hash to an instance variable, and then it returns the instance. Here is a comparison with a similar instance method that Active Record uses to create instances using hashes retrieved from the database. And here are some comments showing what all of those uh, called methods do. So when you compare these side to side, it should not be a surprise that SQL is faster. It just does much less in this performance sensitive code path. So how is SQL able to avoid executing most of this code? So let's go over the different sections in this method. Let's start with this code. So active record starts by initializing all of these instance variables mostly to nil or false. Now it does set new record to true here, but it ends up setting new record back to false here because the method is usually only called with one argument and new record, the local variable, is the second argument which defaults to false. So probably the most controversial optimization technique that both SQL and Rota use is they both avoid initializing instance variables to nil or false. Now, assuming you have six instance variables, not initializing the instance variables to null or false is about 150% faster. For both SQL and Rota, uh, this optimization improves per performance by a few percentage points in real world benchmarks. Now, the reason this optimization is controversial is that accessing an uninitialized instance variable generates a warning in verbose mode. 
So this verbose mode warning slows down all instance variable access, even if all instance variables are initialized. Now I submitted a patch to speed up all instance variable access um, by about 10% by removing this warning if verbose mode was not enabled at compile time. But unfortunately, uh, that was not considered enough of an improvement to justify the backwards compatibility breakage. So getting back to our example, there is one variable that's set to a value that is not nil or false, and it is start transaction state. Now, as you might expect, this instance variable is only used for transactions. So if you are just uh, retrieving a model instance and you're not saving it, it is not necessary to set this uh, instance variable during initialization. Setting it allocates a potentially unnecessary hash, which hurts performance. So in similar cases, SQL will usually delay allocating the instance variable until it is actually needed. And that's another general optimization principle. Unless there is a high probability that you will need to execute something, it is best to delay execution until you are sure you will need it. Otherwise, you may be doing unnecessary work. So after setting the instance variables, the active record model instance then asks its class to define instance methods for all of the model's attributes. Now this needs to be called for the first instance retrieved because active record does not define the attribute methods until then. But after the first instance has been retrieved, this method just returns without doing anything. So asking the class to define the attribute methods is slowing down all model instance creation after the first instance. Now SQL avoids this performance issue. Instead of waiting until a model instance is retrieved, to define the attribute methods, SQL model defines them when you create the class. And that way, all model instances can assume that the attribute methods have already been created. They don't need to ask the model class to create them, which speeds up all model instance creation. And this represents another general optimization principle. Anytime you have code that is called many times, see if you can run that code once instead of many times. Once is better than many. In big O terms, O1 is better than ON, and apply to web applications. This principle means you should prefer to run code during application initialization before accepting requests if it will allow you to save time while processing requests. When the application process starts, uh, initialization only happens once, but the process may be handling millions of requests during the uh, runtime. So the last thing that Active Record does uh, during model instance creation is to run the find and initialize hooks for the model instance. However, if the model does not have any find or initialize hooks, then this slows down model instance creation. It would be best to only run this code if the model actually had a need to use find or initialize hooks. Now SQL avoids the need for models to check for initialize hooks by moving the initialize hook to a plugin. SQL and Roto both share uh, the idea of doing the minimum work possible by default, but they're still designed to solve the same problems that you can solve in other frameworks. So in order to be as fast as possible by default, but still be flexible enough to solve all the same problems, they both use similar plugin systems. So both SQL's and Roto's plugin systems are designed around the same basic idea. Each has an empty base class with no class or instance methods. The class is extended with a module for the default class methods, and a module for the default instance methods is included in the class. You use the plugin class method to load plugins. Each SQL or Rota plugin can contain a class methods module and or an instance methods module. Loading the plugin extends the class with the plugins class methods module and it includes the plugin's instance methods module in the class. So here this is how part of SQL's after initialize plugin is implemented. The class methods module defines the call method. The call method first calls super to get the default behavior, which will be returning the model instance with the hash of values. And then it calls the after initialize method to run the initialize hooks on the instance, and then it returns the instance. So by using a plugin to implement initialize hooks, SQL, SQL makes it so that only the users that need the initialize hooks have to pay the cost for them. Most users do not use initialize hooks and do not have to pay the performance cost for them. Even for applications that use initialize hooks, they're often only used in a small number of models 
And with SQL, you only load the plugin into the models that need the initialize hooks, and it does not slow down initialization for all of your other models. By calling super to get the default behavior, it's easy to implement new features using plugins, as well as to extract rarely used features to plugins. Now in both SQL and Rhoda, the majority of new features are implemented in plugins. Uh, using plugins for most features does not just improve performance, it also saves memory by not allocating as many objects. And that's another general optimization strategy in Ruby. Most objects you create in Ruby take time to allocate, time to mark during garbage collection, and time to free, even if they're not used. And that includes all code that is required, even if the code is not used. Both SQL and Rhoda attempt to reduce object allocations, and string allocations are probably the easiest to reduce. You just need to use frozen string literals. So both SQL and Rhoda have used frozen string literals uh, since shortly thereafter they were introduced in Ruby 2.3. Um, now, frozen string literals didn't improve performance much when I added them to SQL, and that was because year, for years before frozen string literals were introduced, I had stored all strings used to generate SQL in frozen constants because that used to be faster than using literal strings. So after Ruby 2.3 was in wide use, I removed the constants and I inlined the strings, which improved SQL building by a few percent. Uh, this change also made it the code much easier to read, and it made it easier to see which of these strings could be combined, and combining those strings reduced the number of string operations, which further increased SQL building performance. Now SQL tr tries to improve performance by reducing hash allocations. Um, SQL used to have code like this in many methods, where the default argument value is a hash. And the problem with this style of code is that every call to this method with a single argument allocates a hash. And while allocating a single hash doesn't sound so bad, when you have many methods that do this, you end up with a lot of unnecessary hashes being created. So SQL started using an empty frozen hash constant named ops, and ops is used as the default value for most arguments that expect a hash. And using the frozen ops hash is almost twice as fast as allocating a new hash. To save allocations, SQL often passes the ops hash directly from one method to another method. Now, why do SQL and Rhoda both use option hashes instead of keyword arguments? And there are a few reasons for that, but one reason is performance. From a performance standpoint, keyword arguments perform better than option hashes in simple cases. So when you are specifying the keyword argument in the method, and you're calling the method with a keyword argument, using a keyword argument is faster. However, keyword arguments perform substantially worse if you are using keyword splats, either when using a keyword splat as a method argument, using a keyword splat when calling a method, or especially when using a keyword splat both when calling a method and a keyword splat as a method argument. So if you want to write a method named foo that delegates uh, keyword arguments to a method named bar, the obvious, simple, and maintainable approach of using keyword splats is many times slower than the optimal approach. For good performance, you have to take every keyword argument supported by method bar and make it a keyword argument of method foo. And you also need to explicitly pass each keyword argument when calling bar from foo, and this approach makes maintenance more cumbersome. Every time you add a keyword argument to bar, you need to add that keyword argument to foo. Oops, sorry. Uh, that's, not, that's not correct. You also need to make sure that you add it when you're calling bar from foo. Um, if you change the default value for a keyword argument in bar, you need to make the same change in foo. I mean, in general, this approach makes maintenance more difficult and increases complexity. Uh, when you have many methods that delegate option hashes, switching to this approach for keyword arguments is undesirable. I mean, I like optimizing code, but, but not enough to switch to this approach especially since this approach is still slower than using an option hash if you have to splat an existing hash when calling foo. Now the reason keyword splats are slow is that they allocate hashes. It's passing no arguments to a method that accepts an optional keyword argument does not allocate a hash. Passing no arguments to a method that uses a keyword argument splat allocates one hash. Passing a keyword splat to a method that accepts an optional keyword argument allocates one to three hashes, depending on the Ruby version, 
and passing a keyword splat to a method that uses a keyword argument splat allocates two to four hashes depending on the Ruby version. So after that extended detour into keyword arguments, let me discuss reducing proc allocations in general, in performance sensitive code, you should avoid allocating procs that are not needed as closures. Now here's a simplified example from Rode's indifferent params plugin. And one thing to notice about this proc is that it does not have any dependencies on the surrounding scope. This proc does not access any instance variables. The only local variables accessed are the arguments that are yielded to the proc. The only methods called inside the proc are called on those local variables. This proc can be extracted to a constant and then passed as the block argument to hash.new. So moving this block to a constant makes this code over three times faster. Now extracting objects to constants, if their values do not depend on runtime state, does not just apply to procs. It applies to most object types but it is especially beneficial for procs as procs are fairly heavy to allocate. Now, if you're not using the proc as a block and you're just calling it using the call method, you may be able to avoid allocating procs completely. For example, SQL datasets support a row proc, which is a callable object uh, that is called with each hash retrieved from the database. And originally, SQL model used this approach for setting the dataset row proc where self was the model class. And with this approach, every time the row proc was called, it took the row and it passed it to the model class's load method. And this caused an additional indirection for every row returned by SQL. So I guess that I can improve performance by aliasing the load method to call and then assigning the model class itself as the dataset's row proc. And this did turn out to be measurably faster and this is the reason that call is the method used to create new model instances for objects retrieved from the database. And this brings me to another general optimization principle. To the extent that you can, in performance sensitive code, minimize the amount of indirection, as indirection generally results in slower code. Now SQL has numerous places where it wants to use objects that respond to call and it wants to use the fastest implementation possible, which is generally the approach with the least indirection. Many of these cases are used to convert strings retrieved from the database to the appropriate Ruby types. So if you need a callable for converting a string to an integer, it may be fairly natural to use a lambda. In SQL previously used something like this for type conversion. If you look at this method, you'll see that it's calling the integer method inside the lambda, which is another indirection. So it may make sense to create a method object uh, for the integer method. And method objects respond to call, just like lambdas do. And it turns out that using the method object is about 10% faster, but you can still do better. It's actually faster to create a plain object and then define a singleton call method on that object. This is faster than the method object by almost 10%. However, notice that you still have that indirection where you're calling the integer method from inside the call method. It would probably go faster if you could remove that indirection. And it turns out you can avoid the indirection in this case by aliasing the integer method to call and making the call method public. This is over 10% faster than the indirect call and about 37% faster than the original approach of calling the integer method inside the lambda. So I made this change in SQL fairly recently and using this approach for faster callables sped up some real world benchmarks of SQL's SQL light adapter by over 10%. Now in this last example, we saw that calling a method defined with def is faster than calling a lambda. And similarly, how you define a method in Ruby can affect the performance of the method. So let's say you have a method foo that returns one in most cases, you would use def to define this method, as in this example. Now, you could define the method using define method, um, passing a block, and one of the reasons this is not typically done is that calling the method defined with define method is about 50% slower than calling the method defined with def. So in general, you want to prefer defining methods with def. However, when you're defining methods at runtime, it can be challenging to use def. For one, in order to use def to define methods at runtime, you also need to use eval, which can have security implications. 
So one place where SQL dynamically defines methods is for getter and setter methods for model columns. So the approach shown here is, results in methods that are the fastest to call using class eval and def. Now for a simple column, such as name, this approach works fine. However, what if the column name has a space in it? If the column name is named employee name with a space, you end up with this code. And uh, that doesn't work, so that's a syntax error. And if it's possible, if a mean person has control over the column names, this can be a remote code execution vulnerability. So if you want to be safe, you just define, use define method to define the methods. And this is unfortunate, as the vast majority of cases could be handled correctly and faster using def instead of define method. So what SQL actually does is attempt to get the best of both worlds. It partitions the column names to separate the good column names from those bad column names. And for the good column names that can be valid literal Ruby method names, SQL uses def to define them for maximum performance. For those bad column names that cannot be valid literal method names, SQL uses define method so that calling the methods still works if you use send. And this is another general optimization principle that both SQL and Rhodey use. Let's say you have a fast approach that works for simple cases, but that fails in more complex cases. Assuming that the simple case is more common than the complex case, you can speed up the code by separating the two cases, using the fast approach for the simple cases and the slow approach for the complex cases. Now in general, both SQL and Rhoda have a preference for def over define method in performance sensitive code. However, there is one case where define method is preferred for performance reasons. Now, let's assume that you have a class method that defines an instance method. This class method takes two integer arguments and it defines an instance method named numbers that will return a frozen array created from the range between the two arguments. Now the performance issue with using class eval and def is that every time the numbers method is called, it needs to recompute that array. It's faster to compute the array up front and then use define method to define the instance method. And when the instance method is defined this way, it can return the array that was created when the class method was called, which is much faster than recomputing the array. So the basic principle here for performance is to prefer def over define method for defining methods, as those methods are faster to call, unless you can access instance variables, or sorry, local variables in the surrounding scope to avoid computation inside the method. Related to this, if you are accepting blocks and storing them, and later using instance exec to execute them on instances of a class, it is faster to create an instance method using define method and then call that instance method on the instances of a class. So let's uh, implement a before hook to demonstrate this idea. Here you have a before class method uh, that takes a block and a before instance method that will execute all of the blocks that you passed to the class method uh, in the context of the instance. So one simple approach is just to store each block in, in an instance variable in the class and then in the before instance method, iterate over the array of blocks and use instance exec to execute each one. And while this is a simple approach, it's also slow, partly because instance exec will create a singleton class for the instance. It's faster to use methods. So you start by selecting a method name for each block based on the position in the before hooks array. You pass a block to define method to create the instance method and you add that method name to the array of before hooks. And in the instance method, you iterate over the array of method names and you use send to call each one. And this is faster, but you can still do better. Since you know which methods will be executed, you can define the before instance method using class eval and def. So this is faster because it avoids the need to call each on that array and each method calls faster because you're calling it directly instead of indirectly via send. So this approach is pretty close to optimal. But if you only have a single before hook, which is a pretty common case, you can do a little bit better. You check if there was more than one before hook defined, and if so, you define the method 
just like you did before. But if there is only a single before hook defined, you alias before to the before hook method, and that saves a method call at runtime. Now you still want to keep the empty before instance method so that if no before hooks are added, everything still works. And this approach for defining methods for hooks, instead of using instance exec, is over twice as fast, mostly because it avoids a lot of internal indirection. However, switching from instance exec to define method presents backwards compatibility issues. So if you pass a block that accepts an argument to the before method, this will work fine if you use instance exec. But it will cause an argument error at runtime if you switch to define method. And thankfully, you can work around this issue. You check the arity of the block, and if the block requires an argument, you assign the block to an instance variable, and you define a new block that accepts no arguments and calls instance exec with the previous block. So I used this approach recently in Rhoda when I switched to using inst from using instance exec to using define method for handling most of the blocks. And this allowed me to keep backwards compatibility, but it sped up the common case of route dispatching by over 60%. Now one of the best places to start optimizing is inside any inner loops. Even small improvements inside inner loops can result in significant improvements if there are a lot of iterations. So I'm going to use an actual optimization taken from SQL's SQL Anywhere adapter as an example. And the SQL Anywhere adapter was submitted via pull request, and uh, don't be frightened. Um, this was the function for returning rows. Uh, and this is the inner loop. It's called for every column of every row. And even this is a lot of code, but I'll only be focusing on a few parts. Now one thing I found almost amusing about this code, and I hope you do too, was this nesting of ternary operators <laughs> three levels deep with no parentheses. Now, that is not my preferred coding style. Um, that, that was not the reason that there was a performance issue in this code, though. The reason this code was slow was these calls to db.api.sqlanygetcolumninfo with the same two arguments. So this method is called up to five times in the inner loop, and this method returns an array, and only two elements of this array are needed, the name of the column and the type of the column. And note that in, for a database query, the names of the columns and the types of the columns are the same for every row in the result set, and as such, this method does not need to be called inside the inner loop at all. These calls are to db.api.sqlanygetcolumn with the same two arguments. Now this method returns an array, and only the second element of this array is needed. This is the value of the column in the current row. So this method, while it appears four times in the inner loop, is only ever called once. It depends on which branch each of those ternary operators takes. Now this method does depend on the current position in the result set, and actually, that therefore, does need to be called inside the inner loop. So here's the final code after optimization. Uh, a highlighted section is the inner loop. Now one thing to note about this inner loop, in comparison to the other one, is that all operations inside it are on local variables. So to make that possible, we need to set the local variables that the inner loop uses before the start of the inner loop. And this way, we don't have to call methods or reference instance variables to get this data inside the inner loop. Now, it may seem like this isn't that important, but if you're retrieving 10,000 rows and each of those rows has 100 columns, uh, defining these two local variables saves over 2 million method calls just for this one query. And this is another general Ruby optimization principle, which is to prefer using local variables whenever possible, and especially in inner loops Local variable access is faster than instance variable access. Local variable access is faster than constant access. Local variable access is faster than method calls. Local variables are faster than instance variables, constants, and method calls because they minimize the amount of indirection. Whenever you can store the results of an instance variable, constant, or method call before a loop and use that local variable inside the loop, doing so will improve performance. So getting back to this inner loop optimization example. That SQL any get column info method that was previously called up to five times in the inner loop is now no longer called inside the inner loop. 
It's only called one time per column before the inner loop to get the name and type of the column. So we use the type of the column to get a converter object to convert the database string value to the appropriate Ruby type. And we store the column name and the converter object for each column in an array of column infos. Now the first line in the inner loop retrieves the column name and the converter object from that array of column infos. And the next line, we call that api.sqlnegetcolumn method to get the value for the column. And the third line, if there is a converter and the value of the column is not nil, we call the converter with the value to get the appropriate Ruby object. And then we set that object for the column name in the hash. Now one thing to note here is the deliberate use of while instead of call infos.each. Inner loops like this one are one of the very few places where it makes sense to use while instead of each, as that change alone can improve real world performance by a couple percent. Using each for inner loops can hurt performance because it requires a separate stack frame to be pushed and popped for each iteration. So I'm gonna change pace a little bit from the uh, lower level optimization techniques I've been focusing on so far and discuss something that becomes more important as your application becomes larger. And that is choosing faster algorithms, such as the algorithm used to route web requests. Now for Hello World benchmarks with a single route, the routing algorithm doesn't matter. Performance only depends on the overhead of the routing implementation now, Rota has very low overhead, so it does well in the single route case. But when you have applications with thousands of routes, uh, the algorithm used for routing becomes much more important than the amount of overhead in the routing implementation. Now, for years before working on Rota, I used Sinatra for most web development. And one issue with Sinatra is that the time taken to route requests is proportional to the number of routes. So a simplified version of Sinatra's router looks like this. Sinatra first gets an array of all routes for the request method, such as get or post. Sinatra iterates over this array of routes, and Sinatra checks that the current route matches the request path. And if so, Sinatra takes the unbound method for the route, creates a method object, and calls that method object to get the rack response array. And then like Rhoda, Sinatra uses throw to return the rack response array to the web server. And that works fine if you have a small number of routes, but if you have thousands of routes, Sinatra applications can spend a large portion of the request time just iterating over these routes looking for a matching route instead of running the user's code. This is one reason that Sinatra is rarely used for applications with a large number of routes. So Rhoda uses a routing tree, where once you take one branch of the tree, you ignore all those other branches. And this results in roughly O log N performance for routing for most web applications. So a brief example of this is this routing tree. And after Rhoda yields control to the route block, the r.on method is called with the string foo, which checks to see if the first segment in the request path is foo. And if so, the block yields, and only routes inside that block are now considered. All routes for all the other initial segments are no longer considered. If the first segment in the path is not foo, then the r.on method returns without yielding to the block, and then control continues with the next routing method call. So in Rhoda, there is a linear search for the initial segments of the tree. And for most routing trees, it's not a major issue. But if you have a completely flat URL structure where all initial path segments were distinct, then Rhoda's routing tree would devolve back to a linear search behavior similar to Sinatra. Now, I did not consider that acceptable. So for that reason, and for general code organization, Rhoda has offered a multi-route plugin since the initial release. So here is a similar routing tree using Rhoda's multi-route plugin. And the main difference here are the routing trees for the foo initial segment and the bar initial segment are outside the main routing tree and you usually store them in separate files. So Rota takes all these initial segments and it builds a regular expression. Uh, in the main routing tree, the r.multiroute method is called, which will use that regular expression to match against all of the initial segments that have been registered and then it will dispatch to the appropriate routing block 
And this allows for roughly O log N performance for routing for the initial route segments. Um, the multi-route plugin also supports namespaces, which allows for O log N routing performance at all levels of the routing tree. And that's great. But what if we could make routing performance be O1, so that routing had roughly the same performance regardless of the number of routes? And Rotus supports that using the static routing plugin. So this plugin allows for O1 routing for statically defined routes. And this is the fastest way to route requests, but unfortunately, you lose the main advantage of Rota, which is the ability to operate on a request at any point during routing. So with the static routing plugin, you need to provide the full path of the request to match against when specifying the route for that block. Uh, Rota will put all these static routes in a hash, and then before the normal routing tree is called, Rota will check if the path of the request is in the hash of static route paths, and if so, it will dispatch to the appropriate route block. So when using the static routing plugin, the difference in performance um, in routing speed between 10 routes and 10,000 routes is about 15%. So the Tekken Power benchmarks for Rota use the static routing plugin to get the maximum performance, even though they only have six routes. So Rota static routing plugin gives you O1 routing, but you have to give up the main advantage of Rota. Wouldn't it be great to keep O1 routing and still be able to operate on the request at any point during routing? Uh, I thought it would, so recently I added a hash routes plugin to Rota, and this combines the O1 routing of the static routing plugin with the ability to operate on a request at any point during routing. So you use the hash routes class method, which looks, uh, you have a block that is similar to a standard Rota routing block. In this case, hash routes is called without an argument, so the block will set uh, routes in the default namespace. So inside the block, you use the on method to match branches, initial segments, um, just like Rota's standard branch matching, and you use the is method to match full paths, just like Rota's standard path matching. So the hash routes plugin should feel natural for most Rota users, um, even though under the hood, it operates quite differently you know, by doing O1 routing to each of the routes specified inside the hash routes block. Now using the hash routes plugin uh, keeps the primary advantage of Rota, which is the ability to operate on requests at any point during routing. So let's say the path we are trying to route is slash foo slash one, two, three slash bar. And I think most applications have routes like this. And you have static segments, such as foo and bar, and you have dynamic segments, such as one, two, three, where the one, two, three part is the ID of the specific foo that you are requesting. So the main route block calls the R hash routes method uh, without an argument, which will perform an O1 dispatch to the matching route in the default namespace, if such a route exists. Because the first segment in the request path is foo, the uh, r.hashroutes call will dispatch to the block specified by the on foo call here. Uh, the on foo call will extract the foo segment from the request path, leaving the remaining path as slash one, two, three, slash bar, and it will yield the request to this block. And this block operates like a standard Rota routing tree. You can operate on the request at any point inside this block. So the r.on integer call here will extract the one, two, three segment from the path, leaving the remaining path as slash bar, and it will yield the integer one, two, three to the block. And you can look up the foo object with ID one, two, three and store it in an instance variable. And then that r.hashroutes method is called again, this time with the symbol foo, which will perform an O1 dispatch to the matching route in the foo namespace, again, if such a route exists. So that foo instance variable that you set on the line above will be available for all routes in the foo namespace to use, and we assume that one of those routes will be bar. So this approach does add some complexity compared to Rota's standard routing, but I think it is the most scalable design. So it allows for O1 routing at each level of the routing tree, and it supports the ability to operate on requests at any point during routing, which is the main reason that I think Rota applications tend to be simpler than applications developed in other web frameworks. Now in this example, we saw how hashes can be used to improve performance. Anytime you're repeatedly performing the same computation on the same inputs, using hashes to introduce caching 
can also yield large performance improvements. In my experience, introducing caching has the highest ratio of percentage increase in performance to the lines of code changed. I was able to dramatically improve performance in SQL by adding caching to the literalization of symbols. Now, SQL uses Ruby symbols to represent SQL identifiers, such as table names and column names. The literalization process in SQL takes a symbol as an argument, and it adds the literalized version of the symbol to the SQL that is being generated. And how symbols are literalized depends on which database that you are using and how SQL is configured. One of the reasons that literalizing symbols was slow in older versions of SQL is that SQL used special handling for symbols like this, allowing you to embed table names and column names in the same symbol. And SQL would split this symbol into an SQL qualified identifier with a table name and a column name. And that required this, running regular expressions on all symbols to determine if they should be split using this code, which makes everyone sad. Uh, this feature is no longer on by default, but is still supported for backwards compatibility. Now, SQL used to spend almost half of the time generating SQL in this code. And because almost all applications use a fixed set of table names and column names, this was a natural place to introduce caching. So we start by creating a hash for the cache. First, we modify the code to check if the symbol is already in the cache. And if so, we use the already computed value. If this is a new symbol not in the cache, after performing the computation, we need to store the computed value in the hash. Adding caching to this method sped it up over 10 times, which sped up the generation of SQL for common data sets by over 80%. Now, one way to make it easier to use caching to improve performance is to use an approach I call globally frozen, locally mutable. So with this approach, you freeze your global state, such as classes and other objects that are accessed by multiple threads. However, local objects that are instantiated per request and not kept after the request remain mutable for ease of use. Now, the main reason I use this approach is for improved reliability, as this approach makes it much more difficult to introduce thread safety issues into applications. But this approach can lead to improved performance. Because frozen objects cannot be modified, it means that they can be easily cached. And with this approach, frozen does not mean that all parts of the object are immutable. While that would be fine for reliability, it would not be great for performance. To make this approach improve performance, you keep the object's state immutable, but you allow the object to contain mutable hashes that are used for caching. In general, you want to make sure that these caches are thread safe, so access to them should be protected by a mutex. So here is the initialize method for SQL dataset. SQL datasets keep their state in a frozen hash called ops. Each dataset has a cache that is not frozen. Access to this cache is performed through private methods that use a mutex to ensure thread safe access to the cache. And then the object itself is frozen, ensuring that the only part of this object that can be modified is the cache. Now SQL datasets use this cache extensively to improve performance. One case where there was an immediate substantial increase in performance is when I started caching the generated SQL for datasets. So when a dataset is asked to generate the SQL query, it first checks if the SQL is already cached. And if so, it returns the cached SQL, which even for the simplest datasets is over six times faster than regenerating the SQL. If the SQL is not cached, then SQL must generate the SQL for the dataset after SQL has generated the SQL, it can determine whether or not it is possible to cache the SQL for the dataset. In some cases, it is not possible to cache the SQL because that SQL could change depending on the runtime state. And this is another case of separating the common case from the uncommon case when you're optimizing. In the common case, it is possible to cache the SQL and doing so is much faster. In the uncommon case, it's not possible to cache the SQL in which case checking the cache adds very little overhead compared to generating the SQL. Now assuming this is the common case, we generate, take generated SQL and we store it in the cache so that the next call to generate the SQL uh, will be able to benefit from the caching. 
Now, another example of how SQL uses caching is for caching intermediate data sets. Now, SQL data sets have a single record method, which returns the first row in the data set. And this is how the single record method looked a couple of years ago before I added caching to data sets. So the method first had to create a clone of the data set in order to limit the data set to one row, which added a little bit of overhead by itself. After caching was added to data sets, I changed this to call a method named single record DS, and the single record DS method would check the cache and see if there was already a cached data set that was limited to one row. And if so, it would return the cached data set instead of allocating a new data set. If there was no entry in the cache, it would call the block to get the data set, and it would store the data set that the block returned in the cache. So after getting the data set that has been limited to one row, single record bang is called to return the row. Now assuming the data set was in the cache, this turns out to be a large optimization. While saving the data set allocation is only a small uh, optimization, because the returned data set will have already cached the generated SQL, this allows SQL to skip the expensive step of generating the SQL, which improved performance of this method by over 30%. Now, in addition to using this approach to optimize many of SQL's internal methods, SQL also automatically uses this approach to optimize metaprogramming methods that it exposes to the user. Now, for many years, SQL has supported the ability for model classes to add methods to the model's dataset. So the dataset module class method will accept a block and it module evals that block in the context of a subclass of module. And this allows you to define methods inside the block, such as by name to order the dataset by name and released to filter the dataset to only include albums that have been released. So once those methods are defined inside that dataset module block, you can simplify code such as this. You can replace that where call with the release method and the order call with the by name method. And with older versions of SQL, you would use this approach to make the code easier to read and to dry up code, but it did not improve performance. After adding dataset caching, I developed a way to dramatically speed up this code. I added metaprogramming methods inside the dataset module block. So instead of defining the by name method with def, you call a method named order, which will define a method that calls the order method. The first argument to order is the method name to define, which in this case is by name, and all remaining arguments are passed to the order call. Similarly, you can define the released method by calling the where method with released as the first argument and the hash with released true as the second argument. And the performance advantage of using these metaprogramming methods is that these methods define methods that use caching automatically. So the first time you call album.released, you have to allocate a new data set, but all subsequent calls will return a cached data set. First time you call by name on that data set, you have to allocate a new data set, but all subsequent calls return a cached data set. The first time you call first on that data set, you have to generate the SQL, but all subsequent calls will use the cached SQL. So if you call this 100 times due to the caching, you only allocate three data sets, and you only have to generate the SQL once. This is way faster than the uncached approach, which would allocate 300 data sets and would generate the SQL 100 times. So I use caching and a few other techniques that I have discussed in this presentation while optimizing Rota's string matching. So Rota was forked from another web framework named Cuba, and at a point shortly after forking, this was the code that Rhoda used to determine if a given string matched the next segment in the request path. So the match string method should return whether the next segment in the path matches the given string, and the consume method is more general. It handles matching regular expressions to the request path and handling any captures so they can be yielded to the appropriate block. So my first focus when I was optimizing was to avoid as many allocations as I could in this code. So the first change was modifying the first capture in the regular expression to include the preceding slash because it's used later. So we avoid the extra array allocation for the captures. Instead, we shift off the first element of the array, which is the path with the preceding slash, and that avoids an additional string allocation. The next change is we modify the regular expression again 
to use a positive look ahead assertion instead of the capture to determine if the pattern was at the end of the segment. And this made it so we no longer needed to pop off the last element of the captured variables. And we also avoid the allocation of the additional string by using post match directly. Some profiling that I did showed that generating a new regular expression every time consume was called was taking a large portion of the total request time. As almost all strings used in routing uh, for this method are static, I was able to dramatically speed up this code by caching the generated regular expressions. With the corresponding change to the consume method, to use that regular expression directly instead of generating a new regular expression. I could only make this change to consume because consume was a private method. And that brings me to another important optimization principle, which is to keep most methods private. Only make a pet method public if it needs to be public. If the method is private, you are free to change its API to improve performance. Once a method becomes public, you limit your optimization options. So this is what Rota's string matching code looked like in Rota 1.0. Now the consuming of patterns was further optimized before the release of Rota 2, uh, avoiding the need to modify the rack environment completely or do any operations on the array of captures. Now, so instead of using the rack environment to store the remaining path, uh, I, had, I started storing the remaining path in an instance variable and then during matching, we just need to update the remaining path uh, variable with the part of the match after the string, or part of the string after the match. Now, string matching was further optimized later using another general optimization principle, which is to prefer string operations over regular expression operations, where you can perform the same operation as string operations are faster. So in Rota 3.0, uh, this string matching code looked like this. We start by checking if the remaining path starts with a string preceded by a slash. If so, we check the next character in the string. If the next character in the string is a slash, and we have matched a whole segment. So in that case, we update the remaining path to remove the segment that we matched. If the last character is nil, then we have matched the final segment in the path, in which case we set the remaining path to the empty string. If the match is some other character, it means we've only matched a partial segment and not a full segment, so it isn't a true match. Now in that case, we return nil without updating the remaining path, and we can omit the else clause in this case as the behavior is the same. So the main remaining issue with this code are these two string allocations. Eliminating them would make the code even faster. Guess what I did? Guess. I recently did that, so. <laughs> uh, I replaced the start with call with an R index call, starting where we expect the end of the segment to be, and this avoids allocating a new string for the segment preceded by a slash. When checking for slashes, instead of using, uh, retrieving the character and comparing it to the slash string, you call getByte, which comp and you compare it to the ASCII code for slash, which is 47. And this is another general optimization principle, which is to prefer integer operations over string operations <laughs> in the cases where you perform the same operation as integer operations are faster. So I make the first when clause in the first case statement handle the failure case because that is more common than the success case when doing path matching. I also cheat here, and I don't use a method call to determine the proper end of the string. I just use a number that is larger than any reasonable path length since I want all remaining characters in the string. All told, this is about 10 to 20% faster than the approach used in Rota 3.0 and many times faster than the code before I started optimizing it. Now it's important to remember that optimization should be one of the last things that you do. First you make it work, then you make it correct, then you make it fun. This is Ruby, you have to make it fun. And then you make it fast. Hopefully this presentation has helped provide you some useful techniques for making it fast. Now, if I appear to be some sort of optimization guru, remember that appearances are often deceiving. I'm a programmer, just like most of you. While I have experience working in optimizations, it is still mostly a process of trial and error for me. Many times have I tried a new optimization approach, only to benchmark it after and discover that I have made the performance worse. And that is okay, for I have learned something that did not work, adding to my knowledge of what to avoid in the future. I just reverted that code and I tried something else. One great thing about optimization 
is that it's usually easy to see if you succeeded or failed. You can use the benchmark or benchmark IPS libraries to see if your attempt at optimization improved the performance. If you're not sure where to start um, optimizing, start by profiling the code. And there are more options for this, such as RubyProf, StackProf, Rack Mini Profiler, and IRB Spy. Profiling allows you to see which methods are taking the most time, which are usually the best places to start optimizing. If you haven't tried to optimize code before, that now is a great time to start. Optimization is within your power. You all can do it. For many years, we as a community have made it work. We have made it correct. We have made it very fun. Now, let us all work together to improve the performance of Ruby libraries and through them the performance of Ruby programs. Together, let us usher in a new age of Ruby performance. <laughs> we as a community can do it. Kore de watashi no apio wa ori desu. Watashi no hanashi okite kerete arigato. I am uh, sure that some of you have questions. Uh, please ask them now. Hazukashi garanade. Shisumo and shite kurasai. Thanks for, thanks for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, you had the active record code there where you had to find uh, attribute methods. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I know that an active record, the reason why it's called uh, when you're instantiating the first one is because you want to delay loading the schema. Yes. And I'm wondering how schema handles that because it sounds like you just define everything right up front. Does that mean when you declare the class it immediately re con connects to the database? Correct, correct. I I assuming you want, uh, so SQL will always do that. So Sometimes starting up SQL is slower than starting up active record. I mean, there's a different approach um, in SQL. Uh, we often just load everything up front and expect that you're going to need it. Active record, actually, if you require active record and don't use it, it doesn't even really do anything. It, it auto loads every, everything. So, um, yes. Now, one approach that active record could use, if they wanted to, <laughs> um, would be to, uh, by default, not do that. And then in things like development, where you want to, you know, have load things quickly, um, then add the, add, override the method, add the code then to do it. That's one way to, to make it faster. Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Hi, thank you for the talk. You. Uh, I think you showed many and various optimization. Um, I was wondering what do you think, like should Ruby implementation try to address some of this optimization, like what proportion? I think like there's a potential, for instance, for the JIT to address some of these and maybe even a good part of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Ruby implementations, um, like I mentioned, keyword arguments being slow. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Ruby, we could probably get it so that uh, a splat on the uh, caller side did not allocate hashes. Um, a splat on the callee side pretty much always has to allocate unless you can perform escape analysis and determine that it's not used. Um, it certainly would be great to get, get there. Um, hopefully we can get there eventually, but right now it's, uh, there's some things you have to do if you want to be fast that aren't necessarily the best. Okay, thanks. Thank you. That, anyone else? All right. Arigato.